Yeah. Yep. <laughs> John. I have Anthony Walsh from the Roadman podcast with me in the van this morning. The famous van. There you go. Famous I'm van. I'm excited about being in the van. It's a real van. I thought it was a set. No, no. Proper van. <laughs> proper van. And the thing about it is, the sound is whopper. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds, because everything's enclosed. I was always told that the best place to record is like your broom closet or your car or something. Yeah. I had a, 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 a bedroom up there which I converted soundproof the whole lot. Mics, everything. And the sound is better in here than up there. But like proper mics like to your mouth and all. And the sound is better in this than up there. Because I'm forever sticking stuff to the roof, stuck in things to the walls, yeah. new curtains in where we record the podcast. But I don't do it in person. Mine's yes, mainly yeah, yeah. over Zoom. So Anthony does a great podcast. It's one of my favourite podcasts. And I've been listening to, what was the hunter you had on the other day? I had Ben O'Brien. Ben Savage. Really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, I, do you know, I heard Ben O'Brien on Joe Rogan. Yeah. And I just reached out to him on the off chance. Savage. I had a guest who I knew was mates with him, you know, one of these sort of friend of a friend type things. Yeah. Reached out to my mate. I said, any chance you could get Ben O'Brien? Probably up the walls, but probably no chance. But, and he's just like, yeah, no bother. Savage. So, no, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed Ian McCall, Uncle Creepy as well. Talking about the psychedelics. That yeah. was his nickname in MMA, Uncle Creepy. Was it? <laughs> yeah, with the moustache. Was he any good? He's savage. Savage. He fought in UFC Dublin. Savage. The stuff he was telling me, oh, I obviously won't repeat it here, the yeah, stuff yeah. he was telling me off air, like the, the athletes that he's working with. So he designs psychedelic performance experiences. So he designs... So he was talking about MMA. So he yeah. was saying with MMA, you can see... So... I don't know much about MMA. You're a fighter, so you'll be able to verify. Well, what you're I, I, I train, and I wouldn't be a fighter, but I'd know loads of fighters. I've never fought, but I train. But he was saying you can see in a fight as someone's about to load up. You can see the muscles, sort of these supporting muscles, starting to tense that they're about to load up to yeah. unload that big, the good yeah, night yeah. shot. Yeah. He said if you're taking mushrooms, you can almost see the blood going to the muscles before they load. He's like, yeah, yeah. you know they're loading before they know they're loading. Yeah. He said the mushrooms are that powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy. No, it's, 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 and like a lot of people, like psychedelics and LSD and psilocybin get a bad name, but they're actually the most natural thing in the world. But we look at them and we go, oh Jesus, and everybody knows somebody that had a bad trip. And somebody explained to me, you have a bad trip when you're a cunt. <laughs> if you have nothing to worry about, everything is cool. Like they're so, they're, they, they grow everywhere. Well, I think we're in a weird space because largely that war on drugs through the 80s and early 90s is yeah. kind of over. Everyone's kind of agreed that was nonsense. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like in this weird regulatory space where it's there is still a stigma for yes. about it. But people, I think, were less inclined to be told, you know, here's a load of stuff that you're not allowed to do. People are starting to, in the, I think the internet and access to information, we're starting to question well, why aren't we allowed to do that? Yeah. Why, you, like my man, dad's generation, it's just you label things good and bad. Yes. But now we're kind of going. Well, maybe everything's kind of shades of grey. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's even you know you look at wars. Even it's like it's hard to pick who's the good guys and who's the bad guys sometimes. And I, I think with psychedelics and with psilocybin, what was your man's name that said uh, tune in, turn on, and drop out? What was his name? I can't think of his name. Oof, I'm not sure. Just after he kind of that drop out remark just freaked out America <laughs> when he ca I can't think of his name he's a, like the father of LSD he's dead now but when he was around that drop out thing just freaked out the men of industry and colleges and everything whereas if he didn't mention that name it's like turn on tune in it's like with psychedelics you, you can see what's important and what's not not that you're gonna but I think it troubles governments and politicians because they want people kind of following orders and directions rather than going, no, I don't really want to do that. I want to do my own thing over here. Is that okay? Do you follow Sam Harris? He's yes, a, yes. Sam Harris, uh, for anyone who doesn't know him, he's a podcast called Waking Up and he explores a lot around consciousness and what's beyond consciousness. Yeah. But he uses a lot of LSD, yeah. these sort of psychedelic type drugs for a tool to help them explore beyond yeah. consciousness yeah. and you know in increasingly it's not something that you know fucking your degenerate mate takes drugs it's yeah. like these are legitimate academics yeah, yeah. for you know 
personal and scientific scientific exploration. They're looking to push boundaries yeah. using this stuff. Yeah. Even there's great writers that I follow, and they microdose LSD to yeah. improve creativity. Yes, yes. I know a number of people that microdose, and um, these would be like they'd be across all industry. You know what I mean? You couldn't label these people anything because some of them just do your normal nine to five or whatever, and some people are captains of industry. So it's a bit of everything in there, you know. I texted one of my buddies before the podcast with Ian McCall, and because I haven't taken mushrooms, and I didn't like have a mate on hand. Yeah. So I texted one of my mates. I said that I knew would probably mess around with them. I sent them a voicemail saying, "Have you uh, microdosed mushrooms?" He sent me back a message going. Negative boss, so I have not microdose <laughs> mushrooms, I have macro dose <laughs> mushrooms. <laughs> oh funny, funny, funny. Let, let's get it back. So Anthony is an ex professional cyclist, has a great podcast, and is a cycling coach. Um I love his stuff because he reminds me and I, I get reminded of I heard a word on your podcast a while ago that I used to use all the time and I haven't used it in about twenty years. A Fred, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, remember you used to go? Oh, yeah, who's your man there? Uh, don't worry, he's just a Fred. <laughs> stay, <laughs> stay off his way. Is it a fighting Fred? <laughs> um, yes. And I was only thinking about that because I wanted to talk about this. We called him a spaz. Spaz. A spaz. Don't go near him. He spazzes out. <laughs> it's like when you have somebody in like a position and you're kind of walking to choke them or walking to take a better position. They just go, <laughs> and hit you with an elbow and the eye or mouth or something. They just spastic out, you know. So that's what you call them, spaz, yeah. He's a bit... Yeah. Just go easy on your man. He's a bit spazzy. Yeah, because you're out on the group ride. You don't want to be behind a Fred. They're the lad who's likely to, you know, just do something wild and run you into a pothole or you on their wheel and they hit a lollipop lady or something bizarre. They're just a, they're a wild sort of bunch. But it was talking to, that you mentioned Ben O'Brien. Yes. I was asking him, what's the hunting version of a Fred? Yeah. I think he's taking, he texted me the other day uh, with a picture of one of the lads saying, here's a hunting Fred. <laughs> <laughs> it was a a high vis on out in the wilderness. Deadly, <laughs> deadly, deadly. deadly. So you 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 rode some some big races. You were in Canada. You were in America. Um, you were in France for a while as well. Yeah, then a year in France. Uh, was funny. So I went through my background. I went through law school. Seven years in university. Went through law school. Went through King's Inn. And uh, everyone in law school, wherever in the world anyone's watching this, probably law school is quite an upper class profession. And I was you know, firmly middle class. Yeah. So I, you know, bank loans out to Wazoo for law school. So on the far end of law school when all my new law mates were going on gap years, you know, I hadn't got the luxury of a gap year. Yeah. Like that's a very upper class thing. Yeah. I was like, right, I need to get working here to pay him back these loans. But I got offered a contract in France okay. and so went to the bank, said, Can I defer these loans for a year? Uh I got a job offer in France, like a job yeah. offer fifty quid a week. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I went to France, they covered everything, like they cover, you know, accommodation, they give you your fifty quid a week for food. Okay. Which I hadn't lived out my Mazgaf. Like yes. if you've 'cause if you're from Dublin and you go to university in Dublin, you, you can't afford to live out your Mazgaf. So you're in your Mazgaf yeah. until your mid twenties. So first week over there with we fifty quid, it's a good budget. Yeah, you know, yeah. so I'm going down a butcher and it's like, grand, I get a bit of steak for the dinner yeah, here. Yeah. So I'd steak Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I had ketchup and rice for Thursday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. But just yeah, it's an experience. It's a humbling experience having that little cash. Yeah. Because yeah. you know, I remember doing races, you know, 240, 250 kilometers long, and you'd come home and you'd have like a McDonald's cheeseburger. Yeah. That's all you could afford. Like, yeah. A yeah. euro, a euro server menu, like. Yeah, yeah. And you're trying to fuel, and this is like, you know, this is high performance sport. Yeah. You're trying to recover for the next day's race. Yeah, it's cycling, like at that level, that just before pro level, that, like, they're basically pros, but there's just no money in it, and they're waiting to get selected. It's, it's ruthless, you know, and the local fellas get looked after more than the foreign imports, you know. They're living with their mans or whatever, so it's it's they're eating a bit better than you, recovering a bit better than you. It's a tough old game. It's a rare air up there, and mm. it's not everyone's designed to breed that air. No. It's up there. No. It's every aspect of it's hard. You know, there's weeks you crash and you're choosing between food and bandages yeah. that week. Like yeah. you have a cut, you're looking at and going, "That's going septic. Yeah. I need I need something for that." Yeah, and yeah. you're like, "If I have, if I treat that cut, I'm not eating dinner yeah. later in the week." 
and it's difficult, but the sport's difficult. Yes. And, and fucking life's hard. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> you know, no it, tr- it teaches you well to go, yeah. fucking, this is not easy. It's you know, how bad do you want this? Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, at, at the end, it turned out, you know, I didn't want it as bad as some of the lads. Some of the lads coming over from Colombia who had nothing. Yeah. You know, I have a safety net of, you know, Ireland. Yeah. You know, middle class yeah. existence. Yeah. I'd finished the university. Colombian kids coming through, they're going it's make it or die yeah. you know and it's when you're against that and you're probably going to see that wave coming up in or if you haven't already in it's, fighting it, 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 it is but they're lucky and I always explain to Max as well like how lucky he is to Ireland is France Ireland is Belgium in MMA okay they're fucking savages yeah in this country we're at a world level whereas like you guys kind of Ireland you had to go to Italy. You have to go to Belgium. You have to go to France. In Ireland, the Italians are coming here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we always have had that kind of fighting spirit. So we do produce world-class fighters, you know. But will it affect it with, you know, kids that are... You know, the kids have grown up with TVs, with computers. Yeah. You know, when you start having kids coming in from El Salvador... Yes. That are fighters that are yeah. you know basically living on hard floors yeah, of, yeah. like Aristotle had a thing where uh, I think once a, once a month he used to sleep on a solid hard floor to just remind them that life's not easy life's hard yeah. like I wonder will these kids from South America that know nothing else that are coming yeah. from Flavellas yeah. yeah and and they they're there already Early, so, yeah. so the main it's kind of changing because the Americans were the top dogs for so many years because they had that wrestling base they're just savage wrestlers but now it's changing and the new guard are the Dagestanis the Russians the Ukrainians the Tajikistans Uzbeks so they're all kind of slightly better than Ireland because they're wrestling like that they live in I was talking to a a Dagestani wrestling coach in Bulgaria just having a conversation in his broken English better than my Russian but he was saying to me um, what he said. I was saying, how are the kids are so good. Their kids are just, they're super wrestlers. And they just get the Irish kids to the ground who are better strikers and keep them there and win. And he was saying about the West. He goes, you know, where from? I can't even pronounce the place. He's from in Dagestan, but it's up in the mountains. And he goes, we've no distractions. Yeah, You have too many distractions in the West. We've no distractions. And the kids are just training from four, five, six years of age, just wrestling, not punching each other, but basic wrestling. But like, I can see the power of distractions, like with the co- the demographic that listens to my podcast, and a, a chunk of those come in then to the coaching company. And really, the premise of it is I moved away from really coaching for out and out performance. Like, I'm not trying to send lads into pros anymore, yes. I'm trying to help lads to recapture their health, recapture yes. their you know sense of just vitality. Um, but distractions they're just corroding people physically and mentally yeah now people can't concentrate and read a book no they're like no. they have to put their phone in another room because if it's there it's like yeah. it's calling them but it, it I find that I'm 46 years of age and I try and read a book and I have to say I have to switch that bleeding thing off because I'm not really technical but like I'm it beeps and I'm like is that WhatsApp is that an email is that in- what is that yeah. so I just need it out of the room to be able to sit down and read a book you know but it's the people building these softwares and hardwares they are some of the smartest people in the world and they understand how to cultivate attention yeah. they understand the dopamine release from if you put a picture up going how many likes did it get yeah. you know, it's, so we're largely pulling against that so you're trying to outsmart some of the smartest people in the world yeah. so I find stuff like physical separation does work yeah. because you know they can't have you know the pop up notification or the blinky LED light if yeah. it's in a lockbox. you know yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I have a little time safe in the house yeah. uh, it's, it's like something like a you know a, a fat lad is used for the cookies <laughs> yeah. you, know, you put it in and you literally set four hours boom you can't get it out so, uh, so. so I used to use that for a while but after you use it for a while you no longer need to use it yeah. you know what I mean you just get that discipline of going it's on a shelf and it's gone you know, yeah. I won't touch you for four hours but turn off the notifications for me it's brilliant wrecks everyone else's head trying to get a hold of it but you, you see about like distractions say and you said something about likes on Instagram my youngest son right he's 13 so 
when I was that age or younger, I'd arrive at a race, say Christmas race, or down to Carrick at Christmas time, and I'd see Kelly and Roach, and I'd be like, fucking John Kelly and Roach. And my dad be talking to them, and I'd be like, fucking hell. Now, my youngest fella, when I'm interviewing people in podcasts, the first thing he asks, he doesn't know anything about anyone. Is he verified? That's what he asks. <laughs> That's the first thing he'll ask. Like, in his mind, you've made it if you're verified. The verify thing is weird, isn't it? It almost reminds me like back World War Two or War One. It's like the stuff people will do, the hardship they'll go through to get a piece of blue ribbon. Yeah, yeah. And this is our modern manifestation yeah. of the piece of blue ribbon. It's like it's yeah. that social acceptance that you no, know, he has something valuable to. Yeah. But who's deciding this? Our Instagram overlords. They like they must have looked back at history because I love I I love. Um, it's Mother's Day today, and this is a little story. I'll go. I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but you see about the blue tick in the First World War in in the UK. When me and you, when the war, war first started, we were going to go off to see the world, and then when we come home in shite, or two or three lots of us, they were finding it hard to recruit people. Yeah, like really hard. So one of the main recruiting drives, and they used it here in Dublin as well, because we sent so many people. The women, they made women recruiters. And say you, they were trying to recruit you, and you were like, no, I'm not into that. I don't want to go because your man has half a jaw up the road, <laughs> and me uncle's missing his legs. They used to put a white feather on you. So they'd put a white feather on you, and everyone knew that you were a pussy. And you weren't going to go to war. So you were like, nah, fuck, I'll go then. And that's what they used to do. So if you look at, that was why Feather is like, it's kind of a social acceptance thing, like the blue tick. It's like, no, the blue tick, I'm I'm more worthy than you. I don't have a white Feather on me. But it's something I'm working on at the moment, where it's, why do I need to have that approval from someone? Why do I even need an Instagram account? Yeah. Why do I... You know, if I go and do, you know, I'm thinking about doing a, a, a gravel ride across Morocco. Yeah. You know, can I just go and do that gravel ride or do we need to talk about it on my podcast? I think, do you know what I'd love to do? I, I, I'm I, on Instagram. I promote my podcast on Instagram and stuff I'm interested. If I hadn't got a podcast, I wouldn't be on Instagram. Yeah. I really, I, I battle with that every now and again. I got rid of Twitter. People are saying, oh, Twitter is great for we just found it too toxic. And it's like, I'm looking at stuff and then I'm going, oh, look at that cunt after saying. And it's like, no, I don't need to see my life, so I just deleted it. Yeah, you know, I, I, for a while I was getting very little inbound. And then the podcast, I don't know, I was like pushing a piano up a hill and it started going down the other side. And it's got all this momentum. So now, no matter what subject I put out, because yeah. there's so many people listening to it. My DMs get lit up, you know that the, the other folder. Yeah, like, yeah. Savage. You know, you're hundred messages in there because yeah. you put a uh, podcast out about hunting. You yes. Know? Uh, you know, people that didn't even listen to the fucking podcast. Yeah. Oh, how dare you? You know, cause <laughs> a lot of it talks about the. So it's, I got a lot of animal welfare people sending me messages, but one of the early points in the podcast we talked about is that, and Ben O'Brien made the point that vegans and hunters are actually very closely yeah. aligned because they both start from a place of animal welfare yeah. and they both start from a place of sustainability. Yeah. But the fucking abuse I got from that, but that would have bothered me 12 months ago. But yeah. I think I've gotten to a place where I've cha- tried to change my relationship with social media where I see myself now as a producer and not a consumer. Yes. So I'm like, I'm going to put stuff out there, but I'm not reading the stuff. Yeah. No, I, I, I like... Uh, there's a hunt that happens here every Stevens's day and you have all these saboteurs and all these crazies turning up. I go out walk the land. I love animals. I just love me dogs. I love animals. But I understand it's necessary and it would be better in this country if we had more game to hunt. If we had game to hunt and it was easy accessible and the tags for deers weren't so expensive, I would hunt 100%. I'm not e- really into shooting pheasant or anything like that, but I mean, like, game, like, if we had elk or bear or whatever, I proper would hunt. But people that are anti-hunting, and if there's anyone anti-hunting in this, follow 
nature is metal on Instagram. And when you see a deer getting eaten, arsehole forced by about 10 hungry hyenas, you'll understand how a bullet to the brain or an arrow to the brain real quick is the most humane thing to do. I was just fascinated by the connection or how the lack of connection that we currently have with our food. Yeah. You know, I'll tuck into a steak, you know, once, twice a week yeah. at home, but I've no awareness because it's that, as we said, the proxy executioner. It's that animal going into the slaughterhouse and someone else doing the dirty work for me yeah. and it arrives, you know, seasoned and pre-packaged for me yes. to just pop it on the pan. Yeah. And my attachment or my awareness of where that's come from, I'm totally removed from the the barbarism, the fucking yeah, yeah. killing, the, yeah. the ripping to pieces of yeah. flesh of yeah. that animal. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to do the podcast. The, the premise of the podcast is anything really related to health, happiness and longevity. Yes. And I thought, you know, there's nothing more central to that debate than food and our relationship with food. Yeah. So it's, I'm kind of, and I think that's why the podcast has kind of grown a bit because I haven't kept it really narrow on cycling. Yeah, yeah. You're you're opening it up a good yeah. bit, yeah. Well, I looked at the Joe Rogan one and I thought, yeah. well, what's he done? Yeah. And it's like, well, he talks about MMA. Yeah. I like MMA, but I wouldn't tune into an MMA yes. podcast. Yeah. But now he has these supporting you know strands around it where one stand up comedy one is privacy yeah. one is I mean, four or five different strands around it so I said right, that's what I have cycling and then I'll have my like four or five different strands around yeah. it biohacking nutrition strength and conditioning yeah. you know stuff like that so it's uh, it, it's just getting to chat with it, it's like a, every day is a school day yeah and I do like sometimes I'll get a guest on and I go my ideas are slightly different than this bloke but I like talking to people I never. It's like, what did you? What? Why did I set out to do a podcast? Because I like talking to fucking random people. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and and getting information. I I find now the life that we live, like some of the best conversations I've had have been on the back of bunch bands with like a doctor, <laughs> or do you know the way? Like you meet all these random people like years ago. Now it's kind of what happens is you get funneled into a group on social media because Instagram or Facebook knows what you like so it's like oh yeah here's a lot of like minded heads like you yeah. and it automatically the algorithms do that to you so that's why I like talking to people from from every dis different aspect of life so you get that and I never really like, Rogan does that. Yeah. He's interested in certain stuff. You know what I mean? But also, like, after you leave school, when do you get a chance to sit down with a mate for an hour? Yeah, yeah. Uninterrupted. And yeah. have a conversation where no one's flicking on phones. Yeah. No one's going up to order a drink. It's yeah. just a conversation. Yeah. With no other motive. Only yeah. to pick each other's brain. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like, no. I don't have to talk to me folks like that. I'd be around there and someone's a TV on, dogs yeah. are running in, oh, isn't he cute? <laughs> so, you know, you don't get that uninterrupted dialogue anymore. Yeah, yeah, no. Don't. And no, that's what no. I was like. I started off with that idea of going like, can't, like what? It's, who's the coolest fucking job out there? Yeah. And I was like looking around at some podcasters, and you know there was Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, Rich Roll, a few lads that I was yeah. listening to, and I was like, Jesus, I wonder could I do that? Yeah. And that's where I started, and I was like, right now, let's see, can I move that way? Look, it's not a full time career. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's trending the right way for me. So, no, you get fucking serious amounts of download, and your your content, like people always say, your content. The people you talk to and the conversations are fucking savage. They're very good, you know. I like some with the with the pros. I do like some of the pros, but I find when you're talking to people like that that are employed or whatever, what they can say is very limited. Yeah. Whereas this hunter or Ian McCall, he's like, yeah, I'm fucking. I work for myself. I just doesn't really give a fuck, and I don't give a fuck if I offend anyone. This is what I do. So I like them types of conversations rather than kind of MMA lads going, "Can you edit that out?" and "Can you edit that yeah. out?" Because I'm trying to sign and I don't want it to look bad. You know, not that I'm trying to make anyone look bad, but they can't say certain things. You know, I had a, a lad there to me a few weeks ago, and he's like, "Geez, the podcast has just exploded out of nowhere, hasn't he? Hasn't it?" And I was like <laughs> thinking about it, and then I was reading the line during the week. I'm reading the book uh, Robin Sharm is the author Everyday Hero Manifesto it's well worth a read yeah. but uh, there's a line in it from Michelangelo Michelangelo showed the Sistine Chapel to you know whoever the patrons 
to pay for it. Yeah. And they came in and they're like, oh, it's a miracle. And his quote was, you wouldn't say it's a miracle if you've seen how much work went into it. Yeah, yeah. I felt like that with the podcast. It was like, you know, for every cool Ian McCall guest you have, yeah. there's 50 conversations where it didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, there's... And it's the ones you think, you're like, you're 400 deep, 400 plus in. Yeah, 400 episodes now, yeah. 400 plus, like... Overnight success. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Overnight success. But the, most of them is fine. Actually, do you know what? The first... I didn't know how to check the download stats. And I'm glad I didn't. Because yeah. if I look back at the first episodes, it's like, there's no one listening. <laughs> yeah. you know, 100 episodes, no one listening. Yeah, 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 and yeah. then even at that, like the microphone was shit. My content was shit. I kept yeah. saying, mm, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh. Yeah, yeah. But it took me that. that and it's still a journey. I'm, it's The podcast is mainly for me. It's not for anyone else. It's finding my voice. Yeah. And it's taken me 400 episodes to yeah. start finding my voice. And it'll probably take me 400 more before I'm kind of going, oh, this is... But it's starting before you're ready. A mate of mine, I'm, I'm 77 in, a mate of mine said, you only kind of get rid of the old creases after about 100. <laughs> so I still have a few to go. He's a decent podcaster. He's like, you kind of find your feet after about 100. So that's what I have to be praying. I'll get good at this after I do 100, you know? But I'm still tweaking, like... Every, everything I thought I had nailed I joined this new podcast coaching group okay and there's lads in here now some of the biggest podcasts in the world in right. this coaching group and I went in I was like I went from thinking the podcast was good to going <laughs> oh my god I have to start all over again like I don't know anything you know you have these categories stuff we know stuff we don't know yeah. and then the stuff we don't even know we don't know yeah. there was just so much of that stuff I didn't even know I didn't know and then I was like what? That? What was that? <laughs> I didn't even know that was a... What? I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I have so much work to do. Yeah. Now, it's that overnight success. That's a good quote by Michelangelo. That's a, that's a good... Uh, have you seen all the work that went into it? Were you ever in the Sistine Chapel? No, never been over. So, Sistine Chapel, I spent a bit of time in there. You kind of can only stay there so long till you get ushered through. Now... When they start showing it to the general public, because they live in there with candles all the time, it was kind of fucked up. Yeah. So it took them years to kind of clean it back properly. But obviously, Michelangelo was a homosexual. But when you look up, if you go home and Google the Sistine Chapel, you look at like all the people touching fingers. They're females, but they're dudes. <laughs> yes. When you see the physiques on them, you're like, oh... He put female heads on dudes' bodies. <laughs> so they're all dudes. And one of the main patrons, this is good because, and then my tour guide, who was bringing us around on this, so I got married in Rome, so it was, oh, I spent a bit of time there. I, I like history, so I spent a bit of time there. But um, our, our guide showed us, when you look at the Sistine Chapel, there's a little section down here on the right-hand corner and the main patron that was paying for it all is there. And he was giving Michelangelo fucking grief because Michelangelo liked the little boys and he liked drinking. So he was off fucking sideways all the time and it wasn't moving quickly enough. So your man was putting pressure on him because he was paying him. So in that right-hand corner, your man is... He did a lifelike... Um, picture of the dude that was paying him to finish this fucking thing and there's a snake around his throat and the snake is down biting his bollocks <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's that's right in the very right hand corner of uh, they should have had a load of Polish contractors in they could have banged out <laughs> yeah, a few weeks yeah, yeah. I, like I was getting a bit of work done the house there and a Polish lad came in yeah. and he comes in and the missus says to him will you have a cup of tea and he's yeah. like no, he's like, I'm here to work. I'll have tea when I get home this yeah, evening. Fucking Irish <laughs> fellas, you fucking nail him with the sleeve. Dude. You never get to know. Yeah. But no, I was thinking about the the idea of the Sistine Chapel, and because a big part of what I do when lads come in to work with us, or even mates that are struggling, and I would meet them for a point, and I'd look at their what they do for their day, because you have this set of, and even it's a good exercise for you to go off and do like you have this what are your values in life yeah. you know what are your four or five pillars that you say these are my values for me it's you know it's family it's spirituality it's you know I'd almost call it personal mastery just trying to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday trying yeah. to read different shit it's sport and so you have these four or five things but then you audit your time yeah. and you say well how am I spending my week? How are my hours getting spent? You know, because yeah. how you spend your day is how you spend your life. Yeah. So if you look at that and then you start going, well, I say I'm a sporty person, 
Yeah. But now, if I look at my calendar, I don't do any sport. I don't have any physical activity. Yeah. You know, how you either have to change your behaviour or you have to drop that as a value, or yeah. else you're schizophrenic. Yes. You know, but people don't have habits, and Seneca has this great quote. Uh, you know, we don't decide our future; we decide our habits, and our habits decide our future. Yes. Uh, that I'm just so big on habits. Mm. You know, it's just I've rigid morning routines. I've rigid even before I came down here this morning. If I don't get up. 90 minutes before I need to leave for something it's like I'm going to be late because yeah, so yeah. I've, I've 60 minutes of solid stuff that I need like my grounding for the day I need to get up I need to journal red light cold shower or a bit of meditation brew me coffee in kind of a meaningful way and then that kind of sets me up Yeah. so if something crap happens then an hour into the day yeah. I'm not in reactive mode I'm still kind of well grounded and I'm still kind of internally a bit of calm about me Yeah. but if I don't have that first thing in the morning I'm a disaster and same in the evening so I'm coaching lads who are, you know, Wall Street investment bankers, London bankers, busiest dudes in the world. Yeah. And, you know, the crazy stuff that's thrown at them during the day. But I'm like, get a hold of the first half an hour to an hour of your morning yeah. and the last half an hour, hour at night. Yeah. Control those two and you can control a lot of your day. Like, mm -hmm. control having that habits around sleep, you know, how do you wind down in the evening? So you can, because sleep is so, Matthew Walker has the great book, Why We Sleep. Yeah. You know, and if you can't get a good night's sleep, you're bollocks the next day. Productivity's fucked. You know, you're you just you're not a nice person to be around. Yeah. Athletic performance is compromised. You know, yeah. resting heart rates up, heart rate variability's down. It's just it, it affects us so so much. Yeah. But we can control it by just controlling that last hour. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's it's like the sleep thing. Like I, I'm, we're talking about sleep. I had a shit sleep last night. I got into bed at four o'clock. I was up real late, and I'm ready today because of it now that never happens but it just happened last night I kind of have to roll with it but like I would fo follow um, and I read a lot of his stuff on your man from Stanford what's his name to Humor Humor Lab uh, Huberman and his s studies on sleep sleep quality the production of testosterone human growth hormone quality REM sleep like when you see what he's putting out it's like how fucking important is it now my if you see my room up there always my mom always had black outlining in our curtains yeah so like my i removed there's no tellies in our room nothing like that no false light it resembles a cave that's it's black as fuck because it it's really important and the older you get you're younger than me you're asleep you hear a little thing and a fucking you're up, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's really important sleep. Sleep but is... There's amazing studies on even a little strip of light coming through your curtain. Yeah. And I don't know the, the numbers off your head, but the impairment that has on your mental health is absolutely huge. Even a tiny little speck it's of light mad, coming into it? your bedroom. It's mad. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's mad. But like we know how important this is, yeah. and yes, people have habits that knowingly, maybe they don't know it, but... They have habits that undermine their sleep. You yeah. know, people watch Netflix until like one o'clock in the morning and yeah. then go to bed. Yeah. You never do anything good. Maybe, you know, riding the missus, but you don't do anything good <laughs> from 10 o'clock onwards. Yeah, yeah. So it's shite. It's yeah. flicking on crap on Netflix yeah. and going, what do I watch? Yeah. It's mindless. Yeah. You can take that out of your life and add in a routine there that's going to give you a better sleep, put you in a better mood all day the next yeah. day. You're more likely to train. Testosterone levels are elevated. You're yeah. more likely to be productive to start that business, whatever your side hustle is. You've just more energy for life. It's the sleep part, and I remember I listened to, he's a bad name to mention as well, but he was an Italian coach, um, Ciccini. He was Pantani's fucking okay. performance coach. Now, had him fucking up to the gills. But anyway, he had a huge thing on sleep he put it as one of the best in uh, uh, performances that a cyclist could use yeah as good as training you know what I mean quality quality good sleep you know it was super important you know and there's loads of little hacks around it like there's I've even played around with you can get these mattresses now that have a, a layer it, it basically pumps we sleep best when our brain drops two degrees from our normal temperature so, you know, you can do stuff like leaving the bedroom window open, but then, like you're saying, if you're in an urban area, you might be getting noise and stuff coming in. But you can get these mattresses that just pump cold water just in under the mattress to just bring your core temperature down a little. Savage. Like, the hacks around it are starting to get brilliant. Savage. And when you see that the, the atomic habits, when they talk about with Brailsford, 
when he it talked about the study with they were looking into beds. Yeah. So they were testing all these beds, different mattresses, different pillows for the cyclists to get all them like half a percent minute advantages. It's like there's something in that. All athletes, all normal people with their side hustles or whatever need to kind of get on that because but, it's super important. And it starts for like for the whole history of you know humanity. The sun started going down, and when the sun started going down, our body started releasing melatonin, yeah. which is our our body saying it's time to go to sleep. You start getting a little bit sleepy, and then the morning the sun started going up, we started releasing serotonin, our wake up hormone. So yeah. it's a pretty easy system. Sun goes down, sun goes up, we release one hormone. Now what happens? Sun starts going down, body starts ramping up melatonin production, getting ready for bed. Chick iPad goes on, <laughs> and now the body's like, what? Is it morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We ramp up serotonin production and yeah. inhibit melatonin production. Yeah. Like it doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. But you can hack that stuff easily by just you know, as the sun goes down, starting to turn off the bright lights around the house, starting yeah. to light an odd candle around the house. Yeah. yeah. Having a cut off on mobile phone use, say yeah. like nine o'clock at night, that's it. Phones go off, screens go off. Yeah. If we're doing anything it's reading, if we're doing anything it's chatting or playing a board game or yeah, no, it's it's um it's important. It's really important. My my younger my oldest fella who's injured at the moment, but we're talking about sleep. I was down with one of the guys that coaches him yesterday and we were having a similar type of conversation about sleep. But he the coaches just have to come in out of a hyperbaric chamber. So he spent an hour in the hyperbaric chamber, ninety percent oxygen yeah, and he was explaining to me that how this increases stem cell production in the bodies, testosterone, and it's like he needs it, like just to feel better. And it, the results are there that this improves your performance, makes you a better person. But stem cells, testosterone, human growth hormone. If you're an athlete, naturally that's what you're after. Another brilliant hack on this. And if you look at where this stuff comes from, it's interesting because it starts off with uber top athletes you know the ultra rich athletes your yeah. Cristiano Ronaldo's that are really into it your LeBron James's yeah. and then it trickles down you know sport and Hollywood celebrities start yeah. using it yeah. but by the time it hits Joe Soaps it's 10 years later yeah like, yeah yeah you know, but one of the things that it's interesting I'm uh, had a, the founder from a company called Jove J-O-O-V-V and they create these units light units for photobiomodulation it's called and just chatting with him off air and I was saying you know what's the marketing like he's like don't mark he's like all of our sales are he's like we're supplying almost every player in the NBA the National Hockey League everyone's using it yeah. so it's all that stuff you were talking about yeah. it's testosterone growth it's yeah. serotonin production but I'm just using that every morning now so it's part of my routine so you get this belt of red light yeah, yeah. and it's like whoa it, you know your body knows it's morning yeah, this yeah. comes on it's morning you're yeah. kind of there with sleep in your eyes and it's like <laughs> <"Pff>, ah yeah. <laughs> you know it's better than any coffee like yeah savage savage but I know you were a man for the cold water as well yeah no no we cold showers and cold sea swimming and yeah but that's yeah, like yeah, a coffee yeah. as well no I? no it's on, on Friday morning, there's a couple of us meet down there on a Friday morning, and I'm fucking, I'm leaving the house at six here, and I'm driving across, I'm like, not in the fucking humour, even though it's really nice, it's just like, I'm not in the fucking humour this today, and I drive over, because it's like a group ride, it's like, if you're not there, you're setting a precedent, because yeah. you're not in the humour, but the bloke you're meeting is really in the humour, and vice versa, and when you meet a group, you always turn up, because when that rot sets in, the group just disintegrates. Yeah. So I turned up, I got in the fucking sea, and lovely, lovely sunrise, and the water at the moment, I thought, I think, even though the sun is out a little, it's the coldest it's been. Really? It's fucking Baltic. But when I came, I kind of was going over there with me shitty attitude, tired. When I walked back up that beach, I was like fucking charged for the day. You know what I mean? But you have so much stuff going on there. Like if you're digging into like the, like I'm, you know, I came through seven years of school and you know from that I learned fuck all about law. But I have this mad thirst for just reading research papers for knowledge reading. Yeah. But you know I always think that wisdom's like a lifelong pursuit. That's how yeah, you get yeah. it. Just constantly looking for it. Yeah. But the stuff you're getting in there, like you're you're grounding. You know 
yeah, you're recharging off the earth, you're cold thermogenesis, converting white cells to fat to brown cells, speeding yeah. up the metabolism for the rest of the day. Also, if you if you look at these areas, the blue zones, yes, like yeah. one of the commonalities in the blue zones. So blue zones are the areas where people live the longest, they have yeah. the highest chance of living beyond the hundred years of age. But one of the common traits there is community, collegiality, yeah. groups yeah. getting together, yeah. and especially for lads. Yeah. You know, it's almost taboo now to get together with a group of lads. Yeah. You know, it's like non-inclusion, but there's a lot of benefits are getting together with a group of lads. Yeah. Testosterone production's way higher when a group of lads are together. Yeah. You're like you're pushing each other on, like. Yeah. No, it was, and it's like there is a few females in their group, but it's a group of lads. You know, it's a group of lads. Now it's it's, and then after that, it was that warm outside. That like I'm staying there just in my shorts, no other clothes on, twenty minutes in the sun. So <laughs> vitamin D, you know, it's fucking savage. Look, it's it was, it's only I was running this morning down the beach, and it's like the sun's starting to come out now. It's so your top off, running on the beach, savage. a little bit of barefoot, and you're like, you just you can't. No matter how shit you feel going out, yeah. you always feel amazing coming back. Yeah, yeah. But it's, the bike's like that as well. I've never gone out on a spin and come back in a worse mood. No, never. Never. It's always um, it's always positive because it, it's like uh, that coach was talking to me about the sleep in the hyperbaric chamber yesterday. He said, I, I only train athletes. He goes, I get all the other people that are employed for me to try, try to train normal Joe Soaps. He goes, I only train athletes because they're so full of positivity or business owners and and they feed me rather than drain me. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So when you're out in a group ride and you have a few blokes lining up to eight, to do 80 miles, there's some core belief there before they even do it. And yeah, you get the odd lunatic out that mightn't last, but all the lads know what the sus is. You know what I mean? They're all positive. They're all going to dig in. They're all going to help each other, you know? I'm big into that one. I think we might even mention this. It was around the time you were on my podcast and someone had told me this story. And it's just it's one that stuck in my head. And I've wrote it down in my journal loads of times since. And I was chatting to a buddy and he was a sea rescue swimmer. Yes. And I'm not sure if you remember this one. So he was saying once in a career, the helicopter goes out to a sinking ship and there's five lads in the water but there's only three places on the helicopter, or there's seven lads in the water, and there's only five places on the helicopter. But he, he's basically got a choice of who lives and who dies. Yeah. So I was like, well, how do you make the choice who yeah. lives and who dies? And he's like, there's waves are crashing down, the yeah. helicopter's barely staying up here. And he's like, you can only save the people that swim towards you. Yes. And I was like, it's such a brilliant metaphor for life and for that yeah. stuff you're talking about. Yeah. Everyone has that mate, and you're like, oh, if he knew these routines, if he knew what I knew about training, and if he yeah. you know, done this bit of meditation, but... He has to swim towards you. You can't help them yeah, yeah. if they yeah. don't help themselves. Yeah. And since I had that realization, especially with the coaching company, fuck, it's changed everything for me because it's now you're only working with positive lads. Yeah, you're only yeah. working with people who want your help. Yeah. You're not trying to be that Hare Krishna on the street, you know, screaming the loudspeaker at people yeah. as they're walking along. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, st- and this, this isn't just be drawn to the winners, but it's another one I heard. It's like stick with the winners. And the winners are the fellas that are fucking digging in when it's tough. You know what I mean? They're they're going to help you along and you're going to help them on. Like a group ride. Like, everyone is different abilities. But when they come together, you know, and use the little tricks of the trade, like the they're turning on the right-hand side if the wind is coming on the left and doing all the little bits that they should be doing, life's a lot easier. Well, I'm, I'm shocked by, I've, you know, I have friends who are literally on the dole and have been on the dole for 10 years they've been on the dole since Italian 90 <laughs> right and I've other mates who are legitimate billionaires you know yeah. some of the richest people in the world and what I'm absolutely struck with when I look for what are the trends that make people happy it's consistent participation in sport at some level yeah. I'm just always struck by it yeah. it's, and when people get out and they exercise it, in a consistent meaningful way where they're trying to progress yeah not what it even it doesn't even have to be a target it doesn't have yeah. to be we're going for that fight yeah. but it's if you read this uh, bounce the kind of 10,000 hour rail yes and yes. it's one of the key takeaways from that it's not just practicing because we've always seen that lad who's gone to the gym three times a week for yeah. 10 years and he's still a fat fuck yeah yeah it's like it's practicing in a purposeful way he calls yeah. it and when I see lads practicing any sport in a purposeful way yeah. they seem to be happy yeah yeah and yeah. I've known very few friends who are depressed but also practicing sport in a purposeful way. Yeah. And that's regardless of income level. Yeah. 
on a separate token, I know plenty of lads who are absolutely balling out, raging with the cash, who are miserable. Yeah. Because they don't have that purposeful practice in sport. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying it's the only thing, but it's definitely a big factor. But it, it's even with with life purpose, like I, I, I have both of my sons in sport. And my whole philosophy, getting them into sport, and, and they chose the sports, like, I exposed them to Gaelic football, soccer, basketball, and it's like rugby. They've played everything. It's like, now you just pick. But whatever ones you pick, you're going to be doing. And it's not that I'm going to somehow feed my ego on what you achieve, because I like to see, it's like you bring your mate out on the group ride when he's done a little bit, and you see him fucking scattering for a while, <laughs> and it's like, this is character building shit, because I'm looking from the sideline, do you know what I mean? It's super important, that adversity that cycling gives you, that wrestling gives you, that jiu-jitsu gives you, that sea swimming, I don't want to do this. You need, I need that, and, and my kids don't realise that they need it, but they look back in 20 years going, Jesus, um, like the stuff I use today, that cycling coaches told me 25 years ago, that at the time, so that's bollocks. But now I kind of go, yeah, I can kind of see where that fits into me life now. I didn't realise it at the time. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like a real stoic philosophy is, um, one of the things is brilliant, it's, it's the obstacle is the way. Yeah. When you feel that going, oh, do I really want it? As soon as I hear myself and I catch myself with that talk going, yeah. like I was going to go down to the gym last night, I rode yesterday morning and I said to myself, I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow evening. And I was like sitting down, I was like, oh, the Irish match is starting now. I was like, <laughs> will I go? And as soon as I caught myself having that thought, I was like, I'm definitely going. Because yeah. it, it's almost this schizophrenic dialogue I have in my head. And I have it with cold showers yeah. all the time. Because <laughs> I get up in the morning, you know, you're beside the missus in bed, it's lovely and warm in bed. Yeah. And I get up and I'm, I, I've made a plan to have a cold shower. I have a cold shower every morning. But as soon as I get up, I've the other, like the internal bitch in my head mm -hmm. going, Ah, you have a bit of a sniffle. Very cold out. Like <laughs> last thing you need now is to be getting a chill. And as soon as I hear that like little inner bitch yeah. voice going, I'm like, you need to shut the fuck up because yeah. this we're not having a discussion. No. This is not a discussion. I tell you what we're doing. We're doing it. Yeah. We're going into that cold water, yeah. regardless of what you say. Yeah. I'd say if someone could film me watching it, it's like no. Yeah. And and if you're truthful about that. Like people say, how the fuck do you do that sea swimming? And fucking, and me dad goes, you're off the fucking head. And me dad slags me. But it's like now, like when I'm walking out, every time I'm like, what am I fucking doing this? Yeah, you don't want to do it. What am I fucking doing this? Or we used to meet down at Cluster Church, and we used to do like years ago. Like we used to, like I was driving up to Glen Lock the other day, and I was like. I used to love going up the long hill and then take the right at Sally Gap and we used to do all that but it's like now I look at that it's like I, d I used to be cycling down fucking dread going oh for fuck's sake but then when you're <laughs> out there it's grand you know what I mean it's never as bad as you think it's going to be and when you come home like I experienced with sea swimming I've experienced it with cycling and I've experienced with participation in running it's like they call it that runner's high when you come in off the bike and you're putting your bike in and you're after achieving something through adversity, not blood all the time, but sometimes blood, sweat and a bit of tears, it's always fucking good. The contrast is powerful. You know, if you like getting back into the van and having the cup of tea. Yeah, yeah. And maybe watching the old clip on YouTube or something <laughs> because you've been in the cold water. Yeah. But, you know, you get no joy out of, you know, parking the van up and having a cup of tea and a Kit Kat. Like, and yeah. you're just sitting there. It's just depression. It's like, yeah. what am I doing with my life? I'm sitting in the van drinking tea and Kit Kat watching YouTube videos. Yeah. But it's the same for me. Like, if I go out and I ride the bike for four hours and especially in a cold winter's day and I don't want to go out and look outside and it's, you know those days, I actually don't mind riding in the rain but I hate starting in the rain. Yeah. Um, no, I'd be the same. I'd be the same. I look out the window, it's pouring yeah. rain. I'm like, do I need this in my life now? Yeah. And then I'll go out and I'll come in after four hours, shivering for the last two hours. But I'll get on the couch, I might throw an old duvet over me, yeah, have yeah. a cup of soup. Yeah. And I'm like, Jesus, this is lovely. Yeah. But I needed that hardship to experience that yeah. bit of comfort. If I just sat on the couch all day with the duvet on, it's yeah. like, oh, hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> But, but modern society has wrapped us in that blanket of not to start that. Don't go out. You know, that's dangerous. Like, when I first start cycling, right, like, 
my first we didn't have to wear helmets in boy graces yeah like we didn't wear helmets in boy graces then i i so i i cycled kind of competitively until about 98 and then i just pricked around with it once yvonne was pregnant with max i was like you know what i'll go out with my bike here and there did that change your risk yes perception it paying a mortgage and i i it's like it was the next stage of when I had a kid. I know plenty of lads that win loads and have kids and ride Rosses and the whole lot. I just didn't want to do that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay, I've signed up for this Because it's dangerous. Yeah, it, it, it's it not even... like that, like... Well, I got, I got knocked down on Hout. I broke my kneecap. I broke a wrist. I fractured a cheekbone. I broke two ribs. Like, I was in two serious accidents involving cars. So, like... That was a bit to do with it as well. Do you know what I mean? Now, there's loads of blokes. Everyone has accidents with cars. But I, I remember just kind of going, I've got a fucking mortgage here and I've a kid on the way. And yeah, I chat the buddies about it. And that, it it's a, I had that same... So uh, my undergrad was economics. And one of the big things from that, one of the few things I actually learned, is risk to reward. Yeah. You know, what is my upside versus what is my downside? And yeah. I'd always be thinking that in most you know, social situations or if I'm going to... You know, going a new endeavor, a business endeavor. So, what's my upside versus downside here? Yeah. Just your pros and cons. But I remember when that changed for me. I was racing pro in the states, and I kind of had, you know, I started quite late because I'd been through university. So I was like, I don't see me really progressing. I felt like I was close to the ceiling, and then I had a stack up in a bunch sprint one day. Just the crash went down in front of me. I went down into it woke up on the ground and I was like I, I knew as soon as I was down I was like this is real bad yeah, and I yeah. went to move I was like I can't move I was like this is real real bad yeah. and I was like am I paralysed and then I started yeah. giving myself I was like you're after getting paralysed in a fucking bike race you yeah. idiot yeah. so I was on the ground I was like oh no I'm not paralysed I like, can bit of moving here like thank god the doctor comes over and he's like what do you want to do and I was like I want, what do you mean what do I want to do I want to go to a hospital I'm yeah. fucking wrecked yeah, like. yeah, yeah. so I had, a, I had broken fingers I had a broken rib I had a collapsed lung a broken, uh, it's the, it's called like Lenoid Fawcett, it's the ball and socket joint in your shoulder. Okay. Broken right across that, broken collarbone, like I was fucking trashed on the mm-hmm. ground. And, you know, a lot of road rash as well. So you imagine 60, 70k an hour sprint. Tailwind downhill sprint. Uh, yeah. Like tour of Poland sprint last year, the one that went yes. past. So it's on the ground, round the doctor says, if you go into the hospital in, it was in Detroit, you could be looking at medical bills of upwards of 250 grand. He's like, do you have health insurance? Mm. I said I do have health insurance but then I started thinking you know the terms and conditions in this health insurance I'm coming from a pro bike race yes. into the hospital does my health insurance cover in cycling gear. Yeah, yeah 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 so I was like fuck I was like I'm not sure and then he's like best thing you could do is if you can get someone to drive you to Canada yeah so I actually it was a lad from Dublin one of my mates was in the race and my girlfriend was there watching so got into the back of her car he picked me up a bottle of whiskey and some painkillers from a 7-Eleven <laughs> and 8 hours in the back still wearing my skin suit he'd cut the top of it off <laughs> and 8 hours in the back of the car drinking whiskey and sure I went to hospital got kept in for 4 or 5 days there yeah. and like absolutely fucked but that was my time going for full time cycling yeah. that was me going like the upside here yeah. like you know I haven't got kids right now but yeah it's like do I want to not be able to lift my kids do I want to you know I don't play tennis I don't play golf I have no plans to do any of that right now but do I never want to be able to use my arms again yeah. you know they're pretty essential yeah you yeah know? and you yeah. start thinking oh, it's just it's, not, yeah. it's too dangerous yeah and I, I did love it but I, I just found that I kind of I, I started a little business and I was all in you know what I mean I I, I wanted to be decent and you kind of come to a stage like you said there I remember being I think it was I was in Australia in 99 and I was going out with this I heard you talking about mentioning Matty White in your podcast Matty White was in the group the national champ the Aussie national champ Steve Williams they were good pros like loads of good English pros as well what's your man's name Julian Wim was there like a good group and I remember being in the group on the training ride it was called the Caluzzi Bunch in Sydney Australia they used to meet 8 o'clock in the morning cycle the waterfall and back same spin every Saturday all the savages from Sydney went to this I remember going looking at about 100 blokes in the group going I'm probably the worst one (laughs) I'm probably the worst one they kept it at a steady 25-26 
they did Belgian clocks. So two on the front, you do a mile off, yeah. off, off. No half wheel and no nothing, just pace. And I remember going, I am probably the worst here. And that's kind of, there's levels to this yeah. year. And I'm down the feckin' order. So it's just like, yeah, I'll do it for fun. If I go out training, I go out training. If I don't, whereas when I was a bit younger, it was like, I train every day. Yeah. And sometimes twice a day. But, but it's unhealthy as well. Because like, I was like yeah. that for a long time. And I'm just coming out of that bubble, yeah. really. Yeah. Where I'd, I'd be looking at it and going, like, the girlfriend would be like, oh, can we go away? Like, it's torched relationships for me. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Two relationships completely torched yeah. off the back of it. Yeah. Like, two really nice girls. Yeah. Like, that I just, I was like a fucking runaway train. Yeah. You know, birthdays, graduations, weddings. It's like, I can't have to train, I have to train. Like, yeah, yeah. If the bike in the boot, you know, doing baby wipes in a car park, putting on a suit, <laughs> going into a wedding. Like, okay. It's not that level of obsession. I like, don't know if yeah. it's healthy. No. And cycling just seems to pull you. Maybe it's just elite sport. It do. I. 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 I think now. I think I weigh about 79, 80 kilos. When I. I won the fourth stage of Tour of Fingal up Holt. So it was a prologue up the steep side of Holt. Yeah. I weighed myself that morning. I was 62 kilos. What? Do you know what I mean? I was yeah. 62 fucking kilos. I was 23 years of age. So. I was fucking ultra obsessive about fuels, about training. You know, probably looking back now, hindsight's a great man. It's probably you probably could have went to sixty-seven. You mad cunt, sixty-five. But so you can't be going to a wedding having points and eating cake. And I get that when you're trying it. But then there comes to a stage going. You know what? There's levels to this, and you're just not there. But there's more to life. Like, you're talking about weight there and obsession with it. Like, mm. cycling is a sport. There's two variables, power and weight. So, weight matters a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was trying to win the National Hill Climb Championships. And it was the year I was in France. Uh, I'm walking around now at about 82 kilograms. Yeah. So, like, I'm 6 foot 2, what, 82 kilograms. I raced in France at 68. Yeah, yeah. And that year, going for the Hill Climb Championships, I had a month at home. And I said, well, I'm going to really niche down on this. So I was training late, so I was getting up when I was having a breakfast, and I was training at that kind of, you know, 11 o'clock, yeah. so I could ride through lunch. Yeah. But then I started figuring out, going, sure, I don't even need to have dinner. What I'll do is, I'll come home, I'm going to down two litres of sparkling water to make it feel like I'm full, take a few sleeping pills, yeah. and I'm fucking straight through to the next morning. <laughs> and But that felt totally yeah. rational, because yeah, yeah, I yeah. knew guys doing this. Yeah. And it's such a fucked up... You know, pure system where you're looking at people and that's acceptable and yeah. that's yeah. that's normal. Like BMC a few years ago, in a, I have a buddy who was the chief nutritionist there, and he was telling me I would have been back seven eight years ago. He was telling me why they had so many broken bones one year. They were pushing the limit to get as light as they can so hard they started taking uh, supplementation protocols to decalcify their bones yeah, yeah, to just yeah. get them that little bit lighter. So every yeah. time they hit the ground, it's like gone. Like if, when you look at back when I was really watching the tour like every time Zule was was Alex Zule was was broke his collarbone I think he'd done both of them about three or four times Tyler Hamilton they were all doing them literally breaking bones all over the place because they were all at that four to six percent mark you know yeah. there was nothing on them like but there's nothing fun about that level of obsession for elite sport but that's the level of obsession you do need if you're going to be in the yeah. it's like you with Jerry Redmond on the podcast so yeah you know, I, heard, I had him on my podcast and he had one great quote he said everyone wants to be a gangster till it's time to be a gangster Yeah, yeah. and it's I feel like that's it with elite sport yeah. everyone wants to be an elite athlete until yeah. it's time to be an elite athlete yeah. and the level of sacrifice that goes into being an elite athlete I was yeah. eating spinach in a cinema with my ex <laughs> yeah. she eating popcorn and ice cream and eating fucking spinach I, when I first started dating Yvonne he used to go up to UCI and she'd be getting something I'm like no, I'm racing tomorrow. Yeah. And I just, like, and even, I kind of went back, I was racing as a second cat in about 2004, 2003. I said, ah, oh, fuck, I'll go back. And I remember I was down riding a three-day race down in Cork, the Corkman three-day. And I remember I won a stage and I was in the shake-up for the overall. And that, like, obsession kicked in again. Oh, yeah. And she's with me just going, what the fuck are you, huh? I was like, you know what I mean? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. It's it's just, like, anything I do, I'm a bit more relaxed now, but, like, if you want to achieve something in sport, like, even being all in, it, it's probably not going to happen, no. but it's all the all in dudes that 
they're going to be in the shake up yeah. all in is <laughs> your it's your entry point mm -hmm. like if you're not all in you know you're not even considered yeah. Yeah. but once you are all in now you're in with all the other head cases who are all, you're probably saying it with your young lad yeah yeah. you know, you got to be all in to even have a ticket for the raffle yes but there's he's, no guarantee he, there he's all in but he still likes his food and he weight cuts a lot and he's still very young the weight like, cuts so unhealthy isn't it? it's it's like he he's walking around about 78 kilos and he'll get down to 70 and then he'll probably bounce back up to about 76 it's nuts yeah it's I, I don't like it but it's it's part and parcel did you hear uh, or you're going up a weight class and that dude in the weight class that's fighting you at 77 he's doing that down from 88 or 83 or 85 so he's walking into the cage at 84 or 85 I heard the UFC founder Dana White he was on the Impulsive podcast last week yeah. it's, it's good if you haven't heard it but he was talking about weight cuts and he was talking about Impulsive as uh, Logan Paul and him and his brother okay. are kind he was talking about like the question was really like is Jake Paul going to get a fight against McGregor yes. and Dana White was saying like, no disrespect to what you lads do yeah. but it's not what we do he's yeah. like what we do is we find savages from every corner of the globe yeah. the hardest men in the world and we put them into a cage mm. and we kill each other yeah. he's like what you do it's fighting at a level but it's a bit of celebrity and it's a yeah. bit of he's like if you want to fight Connor, you fight him at 145 and yeah. I'll hook it up your man's walking around 210 yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like you fight Connor at 145 and yeah. we make it happen Connor fucking he wouldn't last like he'd be lucky to last a minute <laughs> you know, he'd be lucky to last like he's fighting and even I'm looking at his past fighting and going did he take a dive like these lads are kind of coming towards retirement it's like the old the old present in, in, in cycling you get the domestique that's been around a while and the world championships comes up and you're Offering a few bob, like I know a few pro cyclists that you talk to them and go, Yeah, I fucking talk to money. But I was getting fucking first place and I was getting fucking third place. I was getting the money, I'm gonna fucking take it because I'm 32. But he's fighting completely different, different. like Jake with Logan Paul. I watched uh, a bit of I didn't pay the pay per view, I seen the highlights on the Mayweather fight. Yeah, like they're not even near the same weight category. No, they're miles away. So, yeah. you, how can you be considered a legitimate fighter if you're not fighting people in the same weight category yeah. as a basic starting point? Because yeah. yeah. it's what the whole sport is. It's like it's like you being this YouTube sensation. I'm going to take up okay, not a Tour de France stage, but say a stage in the Tour of Denmark. If you're at any decent level, the bunch will nurse you around, and a few people will nurse you around. And then you're paying all the right guys a couple of hundred thousand, they're going to let you win. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a similar thing. But YouTube and my son that loves verified people are all, these fucking Paul brothers are their heroes. He battered him like Christian. Uh, I think he took a dive. Man. He badly knocked him out. It was like, nah, it looked like a dive. But you know, flipping on the business side of things now, as you know, you know, I went through a period where I set up a bunch of different businesses and I, look it didn't bring me any happiness yeah. but having that lens I've been able to see stuff from the business owner's point of view now and you look at lads like that and I'm not saying everyone should be like that but there does need to be more of an eye on return on investment for sponsors Yeah. and a lot of fighters a lot of cyclists aren't getting that piece now McGregor got it perfect he was yeah. a brilliant fighter yeah. he was the showman and he put them together yeah. but you know you can be the showman without amplifying that yes. showmanship like you need to amplify it with social media you need to amplify it with the right PR strategies and he just happened to pull them all together at the same time I, I follow a few cyclists I, I'm kind of I followed the Astana page I like the Astana cycling page I followed that but and I follow a good few MMA lads as well a few runners and stuff they don't get it no they don't get that it's like cycling MMA it's the entertainment business and it's like you or me are two cyclists and all we do is take photographs in our cycling gear all the time and cycling bikes now people are nosy they want to see more stuff they just don't want to see you and a lot of sweaty cunts gone. We fucking killed each other tonight in a cage. They want to see a little bit more to kind of buy into it. Do, do you know what I mean? Well, it's stories. Kind of like, think about any... Like, I remember growing up, my dad had this, like, old-school projector, but he only had one movie for it. It was Superman. Yeah. And we used to project it onto, the, like, the living room wall that quality was absolutely shocking but we thought we were legendary yeah. we watched Superman over and over again but you think about it, break down why Superman is such a compelling story 
it's you know he has the backstory of you know growing up with the family and stuff but he's also flawed yeah like kryptonite can fuck him up yeah like if you take a lot if you take that flaw out and all of a sudden you just have a lad who can fly around and batter anyone yeah. there's no there's no intrigue there there's no story no. there no. you have to introduce that flaw and now there's intrigue yeah but it's like if we don't get to see these MMA lads, their flawed version, yeah. we don't care about their success. We're no. not invested in it. No. So if you ever watch a shit movie and at the end you're like, I don't really care if the hero lives or dies here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they just haven't built the backstory enough. Yeah. And I find that with so many MMA lads. Like I watched the uh, Usman uh, yeah. a while ago, and yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't really care no. who wins. No. There's there's certain other fighters. There's um, a, a fighter I really enjoy him at the moment, and he's just being himself. You're not just seeing, like, I don't like the materialism aspect of it. It's something that kind of turns me off. I just don't like it. But there's a UFC guy, Tug Nasty. Check him out. He's a hunter. He's from Arkansas. Very vocal politically. But I really, he, it's like, yeah, I can get behind him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I like him. And a lot of guys need to kind of look at that. Who, who built that whole hero's journey? Joseph Campbell. Yeah. It was actually his birthday yesterday. But Joseph Campbell, it's like what you spoke about, this like flawed hero. I don't really want to go on this journey, but you kind of have to. Yeah. And you, you have to find the gatekeeper and you're going to turn back. And it's like any good movie, Star Wars, take Luke Skywalker, any good movie is, is built around that. Yeah, you and know? even when I started digging into it, when I started doing the podcast and I started exploring stuff like this, what is the hero's journey? Yeah. And... You, you have this journey inside you but you don't often realise it's there until you start seeing these frameworks for bringing it out yeah. like when I looked why I started cycling you know I didn't come up in a cycling family like you did yeah. you know, I never had that role model of my dad winning yeah. bike races yeah. like I started cycling and I kind of I'm a bit too young I missed the Roach and the Kelly era yes. so it was like early 90s it was, yeah. you know, Martin was Early and Kimmage yeah. and a few lads but they weren't really, they were journeymen like, yeah. you know with respect to them they yeah were no no like, fucking better than I was but it's, it's hard being a journeyman you yeah. know what I mean they were so when I started you know, I obviously had those dreams of Tour de France's and podiums but when I actually unpacked it when I started you know wanting to tell this story on the podcast and I started thinking right well this, the hero has two journeys he has the external journey and he has the internal journey and it's often the internal journey that's actually more interesting and more powerful yeah. And so the external journey for me was getting a pro contract and, you know, trying to win these boy crisis. But the internal journey was actually, you know, and it's even a weird one to talk about because it, as a, you know, quite a, a proud fucking shoulders back yeah. Dublin lad, yeah. it's like my dad had an accident when he was probably mid-30s. He used to play full-time badminton. He was always very fit. Then he had an accident at work and a forklift chopped off his toe. Right. And, you know, through a combination of probably stuff that wasn't well identified then, like mental health and shit physios, he started piling on weight. Yeah. And basically, from all my childhood, him being overweight was a discussion point I can remember in the house with my ma. Yeah. Like, you know, get your fucking self back moving. Not, yeah. you know, not coursing, but in a yeah. supportive way. Get yourself back moving. Yeah. And, and But I could see growing up the lifestyle limitations that that brought. The shit that he couldn't do with me and my sister yes. because of that. You know, I can never, I've never had a 5k run on the beach with my dad. I can never yeah. do what you do with your yeah. young lad sparring. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so my internal journey was a line in the sand for me going, yeah, externally I'm going for that, you know, pro contracts, but internally I never want to let health or lifestyle limit my life yeah. in any way. Yeah. And that's the journey that's actually way more interesting and it's way more important. Yeah. But it's just, it's interesting that having that framework actually helps you unpack that because I didn't know that that yeah. was actually my sort of, my mission until I unpacked it. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, and it's, it's like for me what you you just discussed like being fit being healthy being able to do this stuff like I'll do it like my dad would just ride the bike he wouldn't do anything else but I do this other stuff as kind of to push myself a little and I'm not as obsessed about weight as I once was but like some days you know if I go bananas at the weekend I'm like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I do have the little internal yeah. clock of watching it. If you're drink extra the water. Yeah, yeah. Or some days I won't. Like, not that I'll, I'll focus. Me dad always used to do it, and I do it as well. It's like no food from six o'clock, and I mightn't have a breakfast, and I might eat me lunch at one o'clock the next day. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I do this type of stuff. But it's not really as mad obsessive as it was before, but I do watch it, you know? Like, I can remember 
like I had this moment in my life where I was just like that line in the sand that you talked about there yeah. but it was just such a hard fucking line because I remember it was at a time I'd come back from having the pro contract and I got a taste of cycling and the freedom of cycling and I loved that and I wanted that to be a part of my life and I didn't want to go back into law and working 60, 70 hours a week or any job for that matter working yeah. long hours commuting all that shit. I thought no I want to have the freedom to cycle so I thought the way to get there was building businesses. Yes. So I started the coaching company in 2012, actually 10 years ago now. Savage. Started the coaching company in 2012 and it took off well. And so I had a few quid extra then. So I thought what I do with that money is now I build a second business. Yeah. So then I bought a cafe. Yeah. And then I was like, the cafe was going all right. The coaching company was still supporting both of them. Went to our business. So I tried to launch an app and the app was big. Like we'd done a big fundraising round in San Francisco. You know, all MIT developers and stuff it was a big deal. We won App of the Year awards on the front of the Financial Savage. Times. You know, quest to make the world healthy and stuff. It was a big deal. But then, you know, I was, I was, there was a little bit of arrogance and a little bit of ego around it as well. Where I thought, I'm good enough to build multiple companies at the same time. So I went on, like, built an event pre-registration platform, started a social media marketing agency, trying to scale the coaching company, had the city centre office. And I was still training like 10, 15 hours a week, but I didn't understand at the time that my cortisol levels were ramped yeah, up to the max. Stressed, the fuck. stressed out me fucking yeah. whole. Yeah. And it was the first time in my life I can remember not having a six pack. Yeah. And I remember just looking in the mirror going, oh, I hardly recognize myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was still racing the bike, but I was stopped hanging out with my good training partners. I'd make excuses as to why I couldn't do the hard sessions. Yeah. Stopped standing on the weighing scales and I was just in total fucking denial about my condition and how much it slid. Yeah. I don't know what I weighed then but I'd say it was mid 90 kilos. Okay. Coming from 68 yeah, kilos yeah, in France. Yeah, yeah. And I remember going to the Tour of Ulster which is one of the biggest bike races in Ireland. You know, we second or third biggest yeah. bike race in Ireland. Yeah. I remember going up there and nothing was right. Like, I was on a borrowed bike because my boy hadn't done maintenance. I had to get a bike off of me. I had no fucking pins for me numbers. I had to ring the organiser, say, here, I'm running 15 minutes late. Can you hold the start of the race for me? Yeah. Went up there. Within five... I went with an attack in the first few minutes. And I remember thinking, I could sneak a result today. <laughs> that was how delusional I was. <laughs> went with this move. Fast forward like 10, 15 minutes later. I'm in the fucking last group on the road. And I remember the lads in the group going, jeez, I've never been in a group with you before. <laughs> and I just wanted a hole in the ground to open up and swallow me the stickies uh, so <laughs> I got to the end of that stage my missus was there I only started going out with her then uh, yeah. and I, the four stage race I abandoned it and went yeah. home but I remember on that drive home I was like I wasn't crying but I was as close to crying yeah, as I could yeah. be while still holding it together around yeah. the missus yeah. and it was just such a lonely spot because I thought at that point you know I hadn't articulated it but I knew that internal journey that I talked about, that idea of I'm never going to let lifestyle or health limit my lifestyle. Yeah. I knew it slipped. Yeah. I knew I'd taken a misstep. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm, I'm turning into what I, the only thing I set out not to be. Yeah, yeah. And now I am that. Yeah. And I was like, I am fucked. And I remember going home and I don't know if I'd label it as depressed, but yeah. I was fucking down. Yeah. Like, and I was like, right, what's going on? And I talked to a buddy of mine who kind of mentors me and helps me out with stuff. And I basically just put everything on pause. Sold every company. I wrapped up every company. Just put the coaching company on pause. Sold or got rid of the lease in the office. Got rid of all the staff. Uh, sold the cafe. Sold the media company. Wrapped up the app. And just pressed on pause. And just stood still. And said, right, what's the next move? Yeah. Uh, it was two years where I was doing nothing. And people would be saying to me, what are you doing? I'd be like, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, how do you mean nothing? I was like, nothing. <laughs> Literally nothing. And your mom would be like, get a job or something. I was like, no, I'm just... I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing next. Yeah, yeah. And so I went travelling, went to fucking Bali, China, Dubai, Toronto, all over Europe and stuff. But I was literally trying to figure out what my next move was. Yeah. I was like, I'm not going to make a move until I know it's the move. And then that's when I decided to come back and said, right, it's the coaching company with a different focus of helping people to not make that mistake that I was about to make. Yeah. And it's the podcast. Yeah. But it was two years standing still to go. I was thinking about it like a computer game where I was like, you go a direction and it's the wrong fucking direction. I don't, I'm not going to keep going the wrong direction. Yeah. I was like, I need to come back and yeah. I need to go try a different direction. Yeah, yeah. And I came back and I tried a different direction yeah. and I, I was happy, you know, yeah. and, you know, my body just wanted to get back to a normal weight. Like, as soon as I got happy again, yeah. like, the weight just started coming off and I just, you know, I could feel myself again, you know, I was just laughing and shit all day again. But I can totally see how people go down that road and then they start because I remember one point thinking looking at like fucking fancy cars and thinking Jesus like 
that fucking Range Rover looks nice and stuff. Yeah, thinking, yeah. Like, uh, you're one step away. I hadn't got debt. Shoveling money into that debt. Just keep... Like, you've to go further down that rabbit hole to fund that shite. And, and you're, tr you're trying to get something. You're unhappy, but you're trying to get something material to give you a brief reprieve from yeah. that unhappiness. But that... That was the step I didn't take, and if I did, I was fucked. I wouldn't have backed out of it yeah. because then all of a sudden, yeah, how, saddled with debt which has to be paid. How would you get out of it? Like, mm -hmm. and like, I for the first time, like sitting back, you know, a couple of years later and analyzing that and going, that taking debt on at that point, like I see so many people doing, I can totally see how lads end up fucking sucking on a shotgun, yeah, yeah. And I've never seen it before, and yeah. I just got going, holy shit, because it must feel like you're helpless, it must feel like yeah. I'm fucked here. But you're definitely not fucked. No, no, there's always ways out. Yeah. Always, oh, like, good ways out. Good ways out. Yeah. But it was a fucking weird time, and it was... I'm, I'm big on making decisions. Like, I've always tried to make decisions rather than, you know, just drifting down roads. You know, people are like, oh, I got here, and I never really know yeah, how yeah. I got there. Yeah. I take fucking hard lefts and hard yeah, rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was one of those hard lefts where I was like, poof. Yeah. Um, so even stuff like you know getting into cryptocurrency yeah. you know I remember I sat in the cafe and buying crypto at the time yeah. people were looking at me like I was after buying 10 kilos of coke <laughs> yeah. they're looking at me you're like you're after selling a cafe and buying what it's like what the fuck <laughs> but it was stuff like that where I was like no I this I know this stuff this is yeah, what I know yeah, yeah. and these are the decisions I make but they were decisions like I mean yeah. some of them are fucking you know don't work out great but I think yeah. making a decision is like fucking doing chin ups yeah. you stop doing them you can't do them your muscles atrophy you need to make decisions but do you see most problems in life it's it's like what you're a cyclist I, I still call myself a cyclist it's like making a decision right in the in the break in the group when you don't make a decision you get left behind yeah it's like Alan Piper had a great quote you have one fucking second, one second when a bloke attacks. If you're yeah. not onto him, he's gone. Yeah. So it's like make decisions. Shit happens when people just go, oh, eh, oh, I'm not sure what to do here, and that's when things go pear shaped. It's a great analogy. I've like, never heard it. Make a decision. Yeah. Alan Piper said that you have one fucking second just to hammer something real quick. You know what I mean? And it's like when you don't make a decision. That's when fucking shit happens. It's like ex-girlfriends or whatever, and you're just kind of fucking trying, like amble along and not make a decision, and they just turn into chaos. Yeah, you know? like a common thread I have for the podcast is a variation of that, where I say to everyone, do hard things. Yeah. And it's that doing hard things. It can be you know walking into work instead of driving into work. Yeah. It's you know take the long way home. Yeah. But it's also it doesn't have to be physical. It's it's having that hard conversation with your wife. Yeah to help your relationship grow and move to the next level yeah. it's having the hard or conversation with a business partner so you don't fall out down the road yeah. it's constantly putting yourself in a position where you have to make hard choices and yeah. have hard conversations and do hard shit yeah. it's you getting into the water it's exercising that muscle mm -hmm. when I'm, I'm saying I'm going to do this when it's easier not to yeah. and there's a discipline in that or even even if you have a coach or you see coaching and the coach is great and he's doing nothing wrong, but you're just looking at it going, I don't like the culture here. Yeah. I'm just moving away. The easiest thing to do is fucking stay there and just keep the head down instead of, you've all the other blokes gone, oh, who the fuck does he think he is? You know, it's like, now I, I need to move away here. You know what I mean? It's the same with a job though. Yeah. Like you see lads in jobs going, like, life is so fucking short and it's one pass at it and you mm -hmm. see people doing stuff they don't like. Yeah. For 20, 30 years, and it's like, that. what? Fuck that. Like, Fuck that. <laughs> like, you're waiting 20, 30 years, and, or you're, you know, that, that's the macro version of it. If you zoom in and look at the micro version of it, yeah. you're waiting five days a week for the two days of the weekend. Yeah. You're waiting, you know, 10 months of the year for the, the two month holiday. Yeah. Two, if you're lucky, the two yeah. month holiday. Yeah, fuck that. Anton, we wrap this fucker up. <laughs> I really enjoyed that conversation, man. Um, give Anthony's podcast a follow. It's quality. Really good. The Roadman podcast. He's on Spotify. He's on SoundCloud. Wherever you get your Everywhere. podcasts. Everywhere. Instagram. Give him a follow. Um, 
Please like, subscribe. I'm starting to do this now. I sound like Logan Paul. <laughs> you sound Please like Logan like, Paul, yeah. subscribe. And my uncle was like, when I said it at the start, and my youngest uncle was going, we are saying that, you fucking idiot. There's nothing to fucking like. You haven't done it. Wait till the end of the podcast. I'm like, all right. But, um, no, do you know what I need to ask? Are you on Apple? No. Ah, uh, you see, no, the no, Apple no. one, I have to start doing this, because I didn't realise this was a thing until episode, like, I paid a lot to come in or the podcast, episode 380 or something. It's like, the amount of downloads you have versus the amount of reviews you have like isn't stacking up too well. He's like, you're not asking people to review the podcast. I was like, mm. is that a real thing? <laughs> so apparently you're meant to review. Like you're meant to ask people to rate and review. Whopper. Yeah. I'll get on to that. Rate See and review it. Rate and review it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Take a handy. Bye bye.